Hello, everyone. Welcome to our second webinar with special guest James Staffo, Strategies for Large Scale Wireless System Deployment. So happy everyone could be here with us today. Uh, before we get started, do have some brief introductions. Uh, first off, I am Brian Grand with the TC Furlong Sales and Marketing Team. Uh, for those unfamiliar with the company, TC Furlong is a Chicago area based live sound pro audio production company. We specialize in pro audio equipment, sales and rentals, live event production, and specialty services, including loudspeaker system design and alignment, RF coordination, and repair services. Um, and we have been renting wireless systems for over 30 years and have a wide array of microphones, IEM, IFB, intercom, and assisted listening wireless systems in our inventory. Uh, we're also dealers for all major professional audio brands. Our company slogan is better audio by design. And that means that every sales and rental system that we spec is always custom designed and tailored for specific applications. So before we jump into today's webinar, I do have some housekeeping. Uh, we are recording the webinar today. We plan to post that to our YouTube page within the next week. So we'll make sure to send an email out to everyone once that is live. Uh, please use the Zoom Q&A feature to ask questions during today's webinar. Uh, we do have a designated Q&A time at the end of the event, but please ask questions as we go and we can prioritize some of those questions. Uh, we've also combed through some of the questions and comment suggestions during the registration page, and uh, we'll make sure to incorporate those throughout today's presentation as well. So today we are joined by close friend of the company, James Staffo. For those that don't know James, he's a leading RF technician and frequency coordinator on large scale special events and installations. Uh, he's also a founder and chief technology officer of Radioactive Designs, a manufacturer of wireless intercom systems. James has worked as the frequency coordinator for many high-end special events, including the World Cup, multiple NBA All-Star Games, NBA Finals, Rose Bowl Games, and as a frequency coordinator for the Society of Broadcast Engineers. Uh, James, so happy you could be here with us today. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so uh, before we jump into it, uh, I do want to note that last month we discussed antenna theory in systems on a separate webinar. Uh, Matt, if you can drop a link to that recording in the chat, uh, if anyone wants to go back and learn more about antenna systems. This webinar is only one hour short, so we've decided to keep intermod coordination software and techniques out of today's discussion. We hope to have another webinar later this summer where we can dive deeper into that. So stay tuned for an email announcement for that webinar later. Uh, but James, why don't you go ahead and take it away? All right. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen with you guys. There we go. So you should see my PowerPoint. Yep. So anyway, thanks. Thanks for having me again, guys. I, I've uh, been working with TC Furlong for over 20 years, and I dug out this uh, picture of Nikola Tesla in his um, laboratory in Wardenclyffe. This is something I used on my first web first uh, discussion with TC Furlong over 20 years ago, and uh, it's it's interesting because uh, there's a lot of confusion about wireless because as human beings we can't perceive it, we can't see it, we can't hear it, you can't touch it, taste it. It's not in any of our senses. And really, it was only about 100 years ago when people like Nikola Tesla started to play with RF and discover RF in, in his own words. And that's why uh, there sometimes could be confusion, even if we've been doing it your entire professional year. Certain things just don't manifest themselves until the show starts. So I came up with just a short list of, of things I'd like to talk about. The most important is, Keep in mind that uh, if you're listening to this webinar right now, or watching this webinar, then you probably haven't done a lot work-wise since uh, March of last year. And hopefully we're starting to get back into business very soon. Well, in that little hiatus that most of us got to take, the FCC's regulations involving the, the, the dirt settling on the auction happened. It was, it was actually July of 2020. And now we're going to discuss uh, at length what the ramifications of 
the closeout of that auction are because going back into our shows, we will be um, responsible to know what the new regulations are, what the new laws are governing specific frequencies. Uh, that we lost quite a bit, but we also gained some things and manufacturers uh, are responding to that and building equipment. But in, at the end of the day, we still have much less spectrum to deal with, which means that whereas before you could kind of get a dart board with a bunch of numbers on it and throw a dart and wherever it hits, you were generally okay with frequency wise. Now we're going to have to pay particular attention to everything that we could do to uh, improve our chances for success with wireless. And that's what this list is here. So as I say, it was about 100 years ago today that, um, that we started playing with radio and with wireless. And it was pretty much immediately someone got the idea to create a wireless microphone. This is an original patent, courtesy of Carl Winkler, my friend from um, Electrosonics. And as you can see, you had an antenna on your head. The transmitter was on the back. And the, they, there had to have been some type of tap shoes because this was a full circuit, which meant the stage had to be metal. But this was the first thought, the first attempt at wireless. And pretty much ever since then, we've been thinking about using it in audio. So let's see what the latest and greatest is. This is, uh, again, anyone who would like this PowerPoint, because there are quite a few uh, usable facts in here, you're welcome to it. Uh, the first uh, auction that we all were aware of after the digital television introduction was in June 2009. We called it the 700 megahertz auction. Lots of equipment became obsolete. So what did everybody do? You went out and you replaced that equipment in the 600 meg band. And, and now that also is uh, potentially illegal. Not all of it, most of it. This, and I know there's lots of international people uh, outside of the United States, I should say, that are uh, tuned in today. This, these are the rules and regulations for the United States. Most other countries, certainly North America, uh, are really close. If they're not there now, they'll be right where we're talking about soon. So when we come back into our livelihoods of, of getting back in the shows, a lot of the equipment that we we're using before, uh, you know, July of last year was legal. Now it is not only illegal to use, it's illegal to manufacture, it's illegal to rent, and it's illegal to repair and send back to anyone in the United States. Uh, essentially, we still have 470 meg to 608 megahertz, which is the, the basically half of the television band that we had before. There are two specific guard bands uh, above 608 meg that I still make usable. I just did a large um, Latin music show with Univision in Miami, and I was able to squeeze uh, up to upwards of 20 wireless microphones inside these two guard bands, and that is 614 to 616, a little chunk above um, TV 37, which is uh, never been used in the United States because it was the search for extraterrestrial intelligence band. So there was never a TV 36 anywhere in the U.S. It's still empty except for the little green men that we're listening for. So the two meg above that is very clean. Uh, you're sure, um, I believe the H4s uh, are in there or, or it might be the J5s. It's the, it's the J5s. So don't throw out any of your old equipment above 600 meg. There are still these two very usable bands, and, and I will continue to regularly use both of these as, as the equipment below 608 becomes too congested to operate. The other one is 652 to 663. That's an 11 megahertz, very clean spectrum that is um, reserved for us as professional audio users, and it is uh, 652 and below would be your, your cell phone network uplink and 663 and above or your downlink. So there's, there's a guard band there that the uh, cell phone companies actually would require as well so that your own phone doesn't step on itself from interference. Now, because of the um, reduced spectrum, you have to really follow your spectrum band planning, which means that you have to do all you can in your power to keep the noise floor as low as possible and by doing that, your in-ear monitors, your microphones, and your comms will actually have better audio quality and better range just by proper band planning. 
and we'll have a whole nother conversation probably August or September on specific intermodulation programs like IAS, like Sure Wireless work Workbench. Well, those programs, if you punch in the number, they'll, they'll do the math and they'll say, oh yes, this will work. But in the real world, it absolutely will not because of the generated noise floor by not properly uh, uh, establishing an RF band plan. Whenever I'm the frequency coordinator for a large event, even if I'm not bringing any wireless myself, Rose Bowl is a perfect example. I, all I have to bring is my spectrum analyzer and a computer. The first thing I do is I send out an email to all of the participants who is, uh, intend to use wireless and I establish the band plan. Your RF, IFBs will go here, your microphones will go here, your comms will go here, et cetera. Your in-ears will go here. And that lowers the noise floor for everyone else who now can have cleaner operations and better audio quality, greater range. So we'll talk about uh, band planning, touch a little bit on what's coming down from Microsoft and other um, technology companies that uh, could, well, more than likely will potentially create harmful interference onto wireless microphones. I just wanted to take this snapshot. It's, it's just a picture of a, a small 35 meg chunk of spectrum. And that's what the in-ear monitors and the wireless intercoms look like. This little uh, low sort of hump down here um, in the bottom edge of this, that's, an, that's a digital television station. So this is six megahertz wide. And um, since I did the sweeps from inside of a venue, that looked much weaker because it was attenuated by the walls of the, um, of the facility. <clears throat> so when I say we've lost half our frequencies, if you look at this, it was really only, um, well, between 1962 is when wireless microphones really began to be sold on the commercial market, Vegas and Sennheiser and so forth. Um, and we shared radio spectrum in coordination and cooperation with television stations, television broadcasters uh, until 2009. And then in 2009, we began to start to lose through spectral auctions, the entire right side of that lit, that uh, graphic in front of you. Where we're at now is pretty much everything above 608 uh, except for those two small guard bands is no longer legal to, to use. And if you do get caught using these and don't shut down upon request, the fine is $10,000 per frequency per day. And I do speak to the people at T-Mobile and they are driving around in vans with directional antennas because all it takes is one in-ear monitor inside of a church worship, let's say going on, and you could take out 55,000 T-Mobile subscribers. They don't like that. And in fact, when I was doing the NBA uh, All-Stars, that, that exact thing happened to me. One in-ear monitor for the uh, production took out 55,000 Verizon subscribers. So you can bet the next day, this is during one of the pregame days, the next day, there were Verizon people walking around that stadium with a four foot long Yagi antenna and a really expensive spectrum analyzer. This again, it's just a, it just gets to show you how congested it is. When I said earlier that we used to be able to just throw darts at a, a, a dart board with frequencies on it, that's because there wasn't that much to have to avoid. There were a few analog stations and then uh, digital and analog were both lit off in par parallel carriers. We finally did lose analog, but then the first uh, 600, 700 megahertz auction happened, which made the TV stations above move down lower, which gave us more congestion. And then of course, with the 600 meg auction, we lost uh, over 200 meg of spectrum and the TV stations that were above 608 meg had to migrate down into low band UHF. Fortunately, uh, there weren't that many TV stations, only 13 in the entire United States that migrated to VHF because the propagation of digital TV and VHF would have caused that station to lose about 40% of its market share. So that was fortunate for, for, um, for radioactive designs, of course, because we that's all we make is VHF bell packs, but other manufacturers began to fabricate products. Uh, sure makes a ULXD VHF, uh, Electrosonics makes a, a, a VHF IFB. And though we're not going to get deep in the coordination, I will say this. If you are using electrosonics, VHF, IFBs, and radioactive designs, uh, VHF comms, 
you will require a further VHF spectrum band plan to keep those high power IFBs away from the very low power sensitive comm receivers. So here's a great, here's a, uh, just a sample of an RF spectrum band plan. It's pretty much a typical one that I'll put out um, before a large event or before I start getting all the nasty emails about equipment that they don't own in that specific band and could I alter my band plan. Uh, if you look at this, this, this very basic band plan lowers the noise floor to such a magnitude that I would dare say by following a band plan like this, you can get double the range out of your wireless systems. So if it's a digital system, it won't drop out until twice as far. And you'll certainly get more usable audio out of your analog systems because a, a proper band plan keeps the signal to noise ratio uh, at, its, at its peak, at the best spot it could possibly be. And most analog equipment uh, squelches on a signal to noise a synad reading. Sure has an automatic squelch that if it, the synad, um, for example, the engineers that designed it set it to a certain level. And even though you and I may consider that audio completely usable, there's a component inside the receiver that will squelch that audio out and you'll get essentially a dropout um, prematurely. So by implementing a band plan, you're lowering the overall noise floor over these receivers that are very sensitive. They're looking for microvolts of uh, RF energy. So anything beyond microvolts overloads the receiver, results in noise. If you'll see the um, 72 to 88 meg, well, that's um, your ComTech IFB systems. If you're using IFBs, I, I happen to like Comtex for the only reason that they're not in any other band. There's no other equipment down there that I'm aware of. There used to be some Telex um, assistive listening stuff. I don't know if they still manufacture it down in the 72 side of that area. 174 to 216, that's high band VHF. That's TV channels 7 through 13. And so you can fit your radioactive designs intercom receivers in that band. Incidentally, you can get over 100 belt packs in one empty TV station, and you can put wireless uh, electrosonics IFB transmitters. So if you had only two open VHF channels, of which there are what, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 13, is at least six VHF channels, all you need to have are two open channels, and you can fit a, a good handful of IFBs and a huge chunk, more than you need, I hope, of um, radioactive designs um, comm systems or sure uh, ULXD mics. Then we hop up into what we've traditionally known as the UHF band, which is the 470 to now 608 meg. It, now, again, this is one version of a band plan. You will have to construct your own radio frequency band plan based on the equipment available to you. If you uh, have a rental department or you just receive equipment from um, a, a rental company, well, maybe you are sent Sure PSM 1000s in the G10 band. If that's the case, then you would start at 470 to 495 with your G10s. If they send you J8 split of PM, a PSM 1000, well, now you have to look at the upper side of the spectrum because the J8 is in a higher band and begin to coordinate your other equipment around the Shure equipment. So there are two factors when you look at what to coordinate first, and we'll get into this deeper in the coordination um, discussion. But essentially you start with the least, what you start with the piece of equipment that has the least amount of movement or is the most limited in its frequency agility. In other words, uh, the PSM 1000s, I think they go, let's say, from 470 to 530, somewhere in that area. Okay, so you know you have 60, 60 meg or so to play with there. There are other devices that are only 18 meg wide. So you'd always want to coordinate those first because you have less frequencies to choose from than you would from a unit that's covering 60 or even 100 megahertz. The new Sennheisers, um, you know, they go from like 470 to just 690, you know, something ridiculous. So, I mean, it's great, but then you might want to take into consideration some additional filtering, which we'll discuss in a minute. Anyway, so, so you want to uh, be very specific about how you coordinate 470 to 608, because that is a chunk of spectrum that's not removed from anything else. You have to design your own uh, frequency band plan. As you can see what I did, I like to try to keep 
10 megahertz of a guard band between the in-ear monitors and the wireless microphones. Again, because there's a, something called splatter, and that is when you have too many wireless transmitters going into a combiner, they create intermod and they splatter outside of the band. So even though your, your eight in-ears might be tuned from 500 to 506, you'll see noise and splatter from you know, well below the 500s and well above you know, maybe 10 meg of splatter on either side. So I like to protect myself from that. Now, it's interesting to note that that 614 to 616, well, there's nothing around there. And 652 and 663, there's nothing available to the wireless user around there. So you could put whatever you want in there. You could put wireless comms, mics, ears. However, keep in mind that as part of the new FCC rules and regs, anything in that 614 to 616 and the 652 to 663 make bands has to be limited to 20 milliwatts. So in my case, what I do is I'll, I'll use a digital wireless microphone because I found that 20 milliwatts out of a Shuraxian digital, for example, is more than adequate to get the same coverage that you would need 50 milliwatts out of a UHFR. Okay. So just due to the nature of the design of digital wireless microphones, the newer components, the, the, the engineers at Sennheiser and Shure be, continue to evolve and learn things, better quality design. We just need less power than we would have uh, if we were using an analog uh, radio system. So think about that, putting digital equipment up in those higher bands that you're limited to um, 20 milliwatts. The other bands, by the way, if you have a part 74 license, which if you don't, I, I, I hope you'll get it. It's not expensive and you, you, you gain all types of priority by having that license, including the first one, which is you can use up to 250 milliwatts as opposed to 50 milliwatts in that traditional 470 to 608 meg band. I'm not saying you always need 250, but it's nice to know you have it. You know, when I, when I had my boats down here in, in, the, in the Florida Keys, I would cruise at 20 knots. But if I saw a water spout, I, it was nice to know I can kick that thing up to 45 knots and head away from the water spout, you know. Uh, above that, now we get into all of the digital equipment. Although I have seen uh, some fixed frequency equipment in 902 to 928 meg band, uh, for the most part, that is a spread spectrum digital band. And the downside of that is that it's a consumer band. So I could go out and to Radio Shack and buy a little radio phone for my house, and it'll probably be in the 902 to 928 meg band. There's all types of um, consumer electronics, and you don't know what you're going to run into in that band. A lot of times producers want to use it to give the audience a bunch of uh, lighted rings, and then they cue it. Uh, the 902 to 928 sig signal for the audience and get a nice audience shot. There's just so much in that band that you, it's impossible to coordinate. 941 to 960, that's a new one for us. Now that's uh, equipment from Shure, equipment from Electrosonics. I've seen equipment from um, Sennheiser. Radioactive Design is considering uh, that band because it's a new band. Uh, and other than the middle of that band, which is 944 to 952, which is a studio to transmitter link band for your local radio broadcasters, the rest of the, the, uh, the band is very clean. And though technically you are supposed to coordinate with the local society of broadcast engineers coordinator for your city that you're operating in, um, most of the time when I call up the SBE coordinator, which is what I did when I was the SBE coordinator, I would just say, you're inside of an arena. It's not going to leave the building. Do whatever you want in that band. Okay. There are very few cities where they'll tell you, no, you can't. Uh, I need to coordinate that band for you. Now, if you go to 944 to 952, yes, you really are required to coordinate with your Society of Broadcast Engineers free coordinator. Go to sbe.org and you can get the page of every city and every coordinator's email and phone number and they're generally very nice guys and gals and they're smart and they can help you and they know the local radio for their city 1.4 and 1.9 gig again uh, 1.4 gig there's some equipment out those are all that that is a new band for professional audio but it is an aeronautical test band and you have to go through a, a, a very strict process 
of when uh, you can use that equipment, at what times of the day, at what specific days, and you have to receive approval from AFTRAC, which is the coordination authority for that band. So yeah, if you really run out of spectrum, you can go there. I haven't found the need and I'm doing shows with 300 RFs. So if I can pack 300 RFs in the rest of that band, then, then um, anybody could. I'm not that smart. Now 1.9 gig decked, uh, that's been around a while. That's where your, I've seen a Sennheiser has uh, an ENG mic there. So there's a, a lot of wireless intercoms, Riedel, Bolero, you have a, a Clearcom FreeSpeak. But this is all deck technology, also essentially a consumer band, and anybody can buy equipment in that band, and it's impossible to coordinate. You cannot coordinate that band. All you can do is try to uh, reduce your usage of that band. If a lighting director wants to come in and use 1.9 gig to control his lights, he can do so. Um, if there's a cell phone repeater that is installed to accommodate a larger crowd at a festival, that could definitely step on uh, portions of the 1.9 gig uh, deck band. So just keep all of that in mind. The, the equipment up there, by the way, when it works, and it usually does, it's great stuff. It has really a lot of good bells and whistles with audio matricing that we'll never be able to do with an analog system uh, to that extent, uh, like radioactive designs. But just be aware that it would be very difficult, if not impossible, to walk into an area and try to operate a Clearcom FreeSpeak if there's already a Bolero uh, Riedel there. In other words, 1.9 gig does not self-coordinate, especially from different manufacturers. So anyway, I, I would, if anything else, take a picture of this just to keep in mind that it's a great screenshot. And if anyone wants to email me a different scenario where you say, well, I, I am using J8s, what would your band plan be? I'd be happy to scratch one out for you. And James, I have a question for you. I noticed that there is no 2.4 gigahertz listed right. on this band planning. Right. Uh, and this is actually a question that we received um, in the registration. What are your thoughts on 2.4 gigahertz equipment? Yeah, so I did, I did read through those questions and, and I don't know if you could see it, but that's the answers to most of the questions are here. Just say no to 2.4. If you can, it's got its place, but the bottom line is, again, it's a consumer band. A lot of computers operate in that band. Um, I've been the coordinator for events where um, as soon as the media came in and everybody lit off their laptop, it, it took out the comm system. And it doesn't matter what the brand was, but it was a 2.4 gig system. And so it's not up to me as the coordinator to dictate who gets to use the equipment. That's my boss's job. But in that particular case, the boss said, no, this is a media event, shut down the comms. So all of the wireless comms got shut down and all the people sure. on those comms went to the wire. So that's why I would say be very uh, cautious of any band that cannot be coordinated. That includes everything above that 663 frequency on this list. And then above that, 2.4 gig, 5.8, and all of those other uncoordinatable uh, spectra. That's great. Um, again, I just wanted to use this graphic because um, we're not going to talk about it, <laughs> but we are going to conduct another webinar. I'll, I'll answer some specific questions if they come up, Brian, but um, I already blew through half of my time and I'm not even close to where I need to be. So. We're going to have to save this one. I'll try to be less wordy. Um, this graphic here, again, I, this is part of it anyway, uh, from Carl Winkler at um, Electrosonics. I don't want to blame him for the picture, but for the graph, that's, that's all Carl. Once you hand a wireless mic off to someone, there's no telling how they're going to handle that mic, whether they're going to do it right, wrong. And as I said earlier, the way to maximize your chances for success minimize your dropouts and improve your audio quality is by paying attention to signal to noise. And as everyone watching this webinar right now knows that signal to noise and distortion is established at the head end. It's a top down management scheme. You can't start off with junk and make it better. You have to start at the head end. And in this case, the head end of the signal to noise control is at the wireless mic transmitter, not at the receiver, at the transmitter. Now, just to make this sort of a little bit 
easier of a concept to process. Think of it as audio signal to RF noise. Okay. In other words, if you look at the graph on the left, the audio on the microphone was turned down too low. So the audio signal compared to the RF noise floor floating around space, because that signal has to zap from the transmitter to receiver, and it's going to pick up the noise in, in the form of audio when it's demodulated in the receiver. You're only getting 10 dB of, of signal to noise ratio, completely unusable. A lot of systems might even just squelch out on that and not let it pass at all. Even though your RF is pegged on the receiver, you'll be getting dropouts because of the Cyanide component in um, the uh, manufacturers that implement that, that technology. Simply by turning up the audio gain at the transmitter, you have increased your signal to noise ratio, improved your audio quality, cut out the background noise and improved your gain. This, and I say again, this, this only applies to analog transmitters, your old, um, I don't want to say old because I still use them, but uh, UHFRs, your Sennheiser 3532s, your Audio Technicas, and any analog comms uh, you might be using, and analog IFBs. You're going to improve your range audio quality uh, by improving your signal to noise ratio. Now you say, well, what is the right number? Guess what? It's going to depend on who you're miking up. Let's talk about lav mics for a second. Uh, you know, I did a lot of stuff with Microsoft over the years, and I mic'd up Bill Gates, and I've mic'd up Steve Ballmer. Steve Ballmer, they're both ex-CEOs, late CEOs, I should say, of Microsoft. Well, Steve Ballmer is a yeller. He didn't really even need a mic to fill an arena full of 13,000 people, whereas Bill was much more softly spoken. So his mic might get turned up to, uh, you know, uh, uh, an 11 Whereas Steve's, I'm, I'm adding 10, 15 dB of attenuation. So again, everything about wireless mics is a trade-off. I cannot give you any hard and fast rules, but by understanding the basics, you, you can master this and improve, um, uh, improve your chances for success. So you have to be able to see the RF realm. Uh, no one could see RF. Some animals can. I've thrown this out before. If anybody on this webinar can see RF, please email me. You're hired. I'll find some, some job for you. So I have a couple of these here. And they're, ba they're basically, it's the eyes and ears to, um, to the radio world, where your TV is, your noise, your interference, your other wireless mics that you may have no control of, what you have to uh, avoid. And your general noise floor it might be just a lighting wall or um, a, a rotating motor or something. So you could start off with some programs. That one is RF Venue has a program interfaces to a computer. They also have uh, software that um, you could tie in certain spectrum analyzers. Uh, Soda Sure has their wireless workbench with the spectrum analyzer rack mountable to tie into a computer. These are the generally lower cost. Um, they pick up the RF just as well as uh, a Roden Schwartz $25,000 spectrum analyzer, but it just takes a little longer because they're sweeping as opposed to the um, immediate uh, response you get from um, one of the more expensive analyzers. This is uh, that ICOM you see there. I bought this, I don't know if you can see it, uh, because it actually has a picture screen, so uh, you can demodulate video if you want to find out what, what you're watching. Um, you also can listen to the audio. There's an audio part uh, port, I should say. It's a, um, a stereo output. So if you are uh, at, a, at, a, at a gig or a show and you're trying to hunt down some RF and you get to a room and there's, you know, 30 reporters, you can listen to their audio. And when their lips are in sync with what you're hearing, you just nail that guy and you can go after him. I like the TTI. It's a wonderful analyzer. I, I have had several throughout the years. They're, they're very accurate for the price and the frequency readout is extremely accurate. So both the frequency and um, the amplitude measurements are very accurate for a unit that costs. Now the new ones possibly as much as two, 2000 bucks or so. But uh, if, if you have that, that, if that's your budget, I love it. It's light. You could hook up a portable um, passive paddle antenna and direction find within five degrees and, and find interference. Uh, this, this page here, this graph, pretty much, um, in my opinion anyway, uh, is the most economical and one of the more expensive 
units that we would use in professional audio. A lot of guys like the Signal Hound. Uh, Jason Glass in Nashville is really um, big on the Signal Hound. Uh, I have the Roden Schwartz. That's actually the same model. And the only reason I need this is because it has um, a signal generator and the RF receiver so I could check cables. A lot of people like to check RF coax cables with an ohm meter. All that tells you is that you have DC continuity. It doesn't tell you that it has no reception at all from 400 meg to 600 meg, okay? So you can't use a, a VOM to test um, coax. You also don't have to spend 25,000 bucks on a Roden Schwartz. That RF Explorer, they sell a version. I think it's about 350 bucks and it has a, a signal generator, okay? A tracking generator. Yes, it might not be the quality of a $25,000 unit, but it will give you an accurate, an accurate um, readout of con continuity at specific radio frequencies, okay? All right, we're gonna move on to some more practical application stuff because um, that's some of the basics. And, and if you go back and watch the antenna module that we did uh, last month, that'll fill in a lot of blanks about um, antennas. I hope all of them. So I think the first thing when, you, when you're hired to do a job is you, you, have to, you have to determine what the expectations are from the boss, whether it's a tech manager, producer, um, audio minister at a church, pastor, you know, what where do you expect this microphone to work? Do you want it to work out on the front lawn or just on the altar? Where do you want the comps to work? Just around the stage area where the youth the band plays or do you want it to work back in an audio room, a green room, a bathroom? Some people smoke, they wanna go where they're calm outside where the ashtray is. So you need to establish that. And that's from there now flows, that is your workflow. You establish your workflow. Uh, the only thing that really affects RF on any stage or any operational area are objects that have, have metallic content. So generally, I'll set up my receiver location and transmitter location backstage, and I won't even look at the stage until Scenic gets done with it, because they're generally going to throw as much metal as possible at some point on that stage. And the same goes true for the lighting people, because they're going to continue to snap on LED walls right up until two minutes before the show starts. So I usually wait until those guys are at least mostly done with their work before I determine where to place antennas. Of course, you want a, a RF sweep with some of those devices that we went over. And then the rest of this has to do with the RF war game, programming devices, um, setting squelch thresholds, rain test, range testing for best case. So really the first thing you want to do once you've gone through the frequency coordination that we'll talk about in August, <laughs> you'll go in and you'll program all your frequencies based on your spectrum band plan, because that's going to be the first thing that establishes, again, your signal to noise ratio, your range, and your audio quality for analog systems. And when your uh, digital systems drop out, because digital systems um, are not perfect. It's just a different animal to have to learn their idiosyncrasies. You can get into more trouble with digital systems than you can with analog. For example, I love the Axiant Digital. I love the Sennheiser 6000. The problem is you will not know that you're going to have a failure until it's too late because it sounds so perfect right up until it drops out. With the older analog systems, you'll hear a little noise floor start to creep in and you go, oh, What's that? You might even hear a little riz in the background. And then you look at your spectrum analyzer and you'll see, oh, there's some intermod from the in-ear monitors that we just lit off. And it's just within that 300 kilohertz envelope of the front end of the receiver that I'm able to hear it. It's being demodulated as a, as a high-pitched whine. Okay. Program all of your uh, devices. Keep in mind that when you sync uh, your transmitters or portable devices, I should say, because you might be syncing receivers as well, <clears throat> that every manufacturer has a different set of, um, what would you call them, operational parameters, I suppose, that sync over. What I do is, as soon as I get <clears throat> a rack of any wireless that has an infrared port, I go in and I hit no change on everything. 
I'll change the frequency. I don't want to change my power levels. I don't want to change whether my power is locked or my frequency is locked. Pretty much no change on everything because every time I haven't done that, it's bitten me. You know, we'll um, go through a rehearsal and we set the, let's say, the guitar instrument pack to minus 10 dB of attenuation. And then I have to change the frequency because of interference. And bingo, it goes back to plus 10 dB. So now you just blew out your entire audio system because the signal is now 20 dB hotter than it was for rehearsal. So I just hit no change on all of my sync settings except for frequency. That's all you should be tampering with much uh, anyway. And if you need to get to a setting like an attenuation because of a loud singer, that should be done on the transmitter, not on the receiver. And then this way it doesn't change when you resync. Okay, if you're using analog wireless, of course, that includes programming all of your analog wireless systems. Uh, at the bottom here, we're going to talk about accessories, but I don't cover these two bottom units. They're used for comms and a lot for in-ears. I see everybody using these RAD uh, TX8s for in-ears now because the knobs go from uh, a, a low fiber setting, which is basically one milliwatt, 50 milliwatts, 100 milliwatts, 250, independent of each input. So maybe you have a band in one section of the stage because, again, you want to minimize your, your uh, noise, your RF noise. So if you were to just blindly crank every one of those up to a quarter watt, you will generate harmful noise onto your own systems unnecessarily. So if the band is so close, you can put them all on 50 milliwatts and maybe the artist who's gonna run down a runway ramp and out into the, into the lobby, that's the one that you put on a quarter watt. Uh, again, look for interference. When you do your RF war game, you're going to find interference. In this case, this is from Tim Veer at Sure when we did uh, our, our Synod cons together. And I think he took this from a Rolling Stones concert. You can see these two um, clearly six meg humps there. That's absolutely DTV from outside. But everything else here that I'm seeing, all of those other peaks are uh, generated from the control unit and the power supply for a video wall. It's, it's not the video wall with the lights itself. Most people would say, you know, oh, well, as soon as you turn the lights on, it created an interference. No, those frequencies are way up in, you know, the angstrom per wavelength. Um, they're not going to affect wireless mics. What we're seeing here, all of this noise are from the uh, electronic control units and the power supplies. So when, uh, the, when the tech manager or the producer comes up and says, oh, you know, what do we got to do to get rid of that noise? And you say, I need some black wrap from lighting. He's going to say, you mean you're going to cover my lights with black wrap? That kills the whole idea of an LED wall. No, you're not touching the lights. You're covering the control units behind the LED wall, and you're covering the, um, the, the power supplies. Power supplies are notorious for generating noise. Next thing, once you're all programmed, energize all of your uh, remote units, your transmitters, your inner monitors, your body packs, your IFBs, all of that. Give them some reasonable separation. Um, I generally try to lay the mics across the stage in this configuration. So if you see the antennas are going to be roughly three feet from each other, that's reasonable. If you stack all of these transmitters up in, in less of an area than this, you're going to give yourself false readings. You'll never get through this war game. The idea of a war game is to look at each and every receiver in a worst case scenario with its own transmitter off. So if you have 20 transmitters, you're going to energize all 20 of your wireless mic transmitters and your in-ear monitors and your comms. Then you're going to go to RF number one and turn off RF number one. The, what you want to see on the receiver associated with RF one are both A and B diversity lights completely dark. I'm looking for pegged or dark. I don't want to see anything in between pegged when it's on and dark when it's off. If you have a single LED being tapped on your receiver um, diversity, one side of your, your receiver diversity uh, indicators, you just killed your range and you, you lowered your audio quality because that means that there is noise on that receiver at that frequency. This is where you go back into your Intermod software and you find a new frequency, tune the receiver, and if it's clean, then sync the transmitter. Keep it on, turn on a number one, go to number two, same thing with all other 20 or 30 mics on. 
If you see one or two LED lights, change the frequency until they go out. Sync the transmitter. Start again. Every time you change, you can get down to, tra to transmitter and receiver number 38. And if you have to change the frequency, you just completely altered your entire coordination and you have to start the war game from RF1 again. But hopefully by then, and by the way, if this all works, which it usually does, it only takes 30 seconds to a minute to run through every one of your wireless mics. And if you're going to have interference, it will manifest itself at that point while you're doing the RF war game. So it's going to save you a lot of headaches. In fact, throughout the show, I continue to spot check and kill my transmitter when it's not in use and monitor receiver to make sure that it's clean. Another trick that I like to do is use some type of a metal tray. The metal tray, because you obviously don't have room backstage, you know, 40 feet to lay out transmitters. They have to be sitting next to each other. I cringe whenever I hand off some mics to a monitor mixer and I see them stack 12 mics between the knob on the console, you know, very convenient and they don't roll around, but you just splattered intermod all over the place and took out all the life safety communications equipment. So I always have everything usually on an eight foot table backstage Get these metal trays. You can get, these are really Gucci ones. You can go get the ghetto ones for 12 bucks for $3 at a Walmart, as long as they're metal. Don't use a cardboard shoebox. It has to be metal. The idea is that you're attenuating the transmitters from feeding into each other, being amplified by their final stage RF amp, and retransmitting intermod products and interference. Okay? When you um, are ready to use the mics, you pull them out of the tray, and you'll see the RF signal jump up. Now, just to give you an example of the difference between uh, RF systems in a tray as opposed to out of trays, this is a graph. The, the bold lines here are the specific frequencies of the RF mics. Here's one right in the middle. There's a specific frequency, these bold lines. Inside of trays, all you have are those bold lines. As soon as you take those same exact frequencies out of the tray, look at all of the, the more shallow gray lines. This is all of the noise floor that you generate by simply taking transmitters out of a tray. What does that mean? You can't have a wireless mic here. You wouldn't be able to use a wireless mic here, here, here. You've just cut the number of wireless mics that you can use in half because of those stupid metal trays, which are three bucks for a dozen. That's a great tip. Yeah, and it's cheap. Uh, you know, I the first Faraday, it's called a Faraday shield, technically. The first one I built was back, I was doing uh, a, a, a um, Children's Miracle Network telethon. I think it was in the early 90s we were doing this at Disney. And we had a bunch of mics. And my dad and I actually built a Faraday shield with double-line copper plywood. It weighed, oh, 150 pounds. So, you know, that lasted like two shows. And I said, there's got to be a better way. But the idea is to, to RF isolate those uh, mics. Uh, a little bit of an antenna discussion, not much of one, because we covered all of this. We're doing, oh, and we're running out of time. So uh, I, what I was going to say, you'll have to tune in, and you're going to post the, um, you're going to post the link to the webinar last month with the antennas? Yep. We just posted it in the uh, chat if anyone wants to go back and see last month's webinar. One thing I will say, I had to throw this in. It's very important when you're t thinking about where to place antennas. Um, think about the location of the receiver. Always look at what that receiver antenna is going to see. Is the antenna seeing the lighting wall for the wireless mics because you've clamped a amplified paddle onto the side of an LED wall and now it's, it's picking up all the noise from the, tra uh, the transformers and control boxes? If so, get a mic stand, move it back 30 feet. That LED wall is very near field. Is your a wireless uh, in-ear monitor, where, where's the perspective of that receiver? It's on the artist's belt. So it's running out into the audience. It's running um, you know, all, all over the stage. That's where you think about where to place your antennas properly. As far as just more success in a show, the best thing I could tell you is grab an audio split of whatever number of mics you have and spot check those. Turn off a transmitter and look at the receiver every once in a while while all the other mics are on stage. Um, spot check each individual receiver uh, occasionally as often as possible so that if there is a noise on one, you hear it and take care of it before it goes out on stage. 
We're going to, we have a couple of minutes, but I could run a little bit late if you want. We're going to talk about some of the more usable um, uh, accessories out there. There are various filters, hel helical fil uh, filters, uh, helical resonance, I should say. Um, that's the top unit. I love those. You could tune them in about 30 seconds to go anywhere from 470 to, to 800 meg. So it covers the entire legal spectrum. Uh, that company is a microwave uh, filter. They're made in the United States. I have one right here. This is a VHF one that I use for RAD. It's got an input and output. And under these uh, caps are screwdriver adjustments. So you just use a greenie and I could tune that. This is a six meg wide. Those are six meg wide cavity filters as well. I'm going to show you some uh, wider band filters. And the reason I have the RF line amplifier on this graphic is because you never want to hook up any line amplifier without placing a filter between the antenna and that line amp. All these filters, the ones on the top half and all the ones I'm about to show you, they go in one place. And that is between the antenna and the first active device. If the first active device is a remote amp like that Sure, which I use all the time, then that's getting gaff tape behind the antenna with the filter in between it, okay? If your first RF active device is your splitter down at the rack, then the filter can go down there. Uh, lots of manufacturers make their own filters. Uh, RF Venue is, is a great uh, filter. Uh, they make all kinds of stuff, as you heard in the last one. Professional Wireless Systems as well makes various filters. Uh, they'll custom tune them for you, which is really neat. Uh, Electrosonics, I believe the one on the left is my Electrosonics filter, and they would be applying those to specific bands of Electrosonics. Uh, equipment, uh, uh, of course. The neat thing about a filter is it knocks out all of the noise. Let's say you have um, two DTV signals, very strong carriers. In the case of a Rose Bowl, Mount Wilson is right above the open Rose Bowl venue. It's a worst case scenario to try to operate multiple RFs, but yet we do it every year and it works because if I need to use this space in between these two D DTV stations, all I have to do is bring this filter and it filters out the interference of those two adjacent channels of DTV to such a, an extent that it adds 30% of range and improves the audio quality of the systems in use. Um, that's all I have actually. We could take some questions if any. That's great. We do have some questions piling up here. All right. Um, but before we start with that, I want to go back to scanning. And this is something you and I talked about beforehand. Um, I think something that's a, a misconception sometimes is how to use the scan data. Right. And, you know, when we get into a really expensive device, like the uh, Roden Schwartz, for instance, versus the RF um, Explorer, you know, I think the, the importance from how I understand it is you can get good information from an RF Explorer, for instance, of what TV stations you're able to see in an area or tracking down someone that might be interfering, you know, using a, a, a frequency that you're not expecting. Um, but can you kind of go through how you use ex, um, like the different antennas, for instance, like, is it good to use just a whip antenna on a scanner or when you should actually hook into your antenna distribution system for scanning, for instance? Okay, so so that's a great question. Uh, again, keep in mind that the uh, I killed my PowerPoint, by the way. That, yeah, you know, that's good. Turned off. So anyway, so the the purpose of a of a scanner is because we can't see RF with our eyes. So the question is, why do I need this particular device at this moment? When I'm on a show, I usually take this this Roden Schwartz and I plug it into the output of the antenna splitter that's feeding my my wireless mics i want this thing to see what the wireless receivers are saying if i have a whip on this thing backstage it's going to look great clean as a whistle so why are all my mics receivers going off like a christmas tree right now because the antenna is out in the house and somebody just lit something off right next to it so i want to put uh, one analyzer backstage and it doesn't have to be that one it could be whatever your analyzer is portable scanner that's going to be connected to the last output of the most dirty noisy gritty 
uh, BNC feed to the last receiver down the chain of, of receivers. Now I'm getting a real world vision of what those receivers, the noise added by the splitters themselves, for example. Sure. If I want to go out and hunt for an interference, you know, maybe it's a, uh, somebody says, Hey, a news crew just came in and all of a sudden I'm taking hits on, you know, of course it'll be the mic that's on stage right now. Uh, that's when you grab your portable analyzer and you could grab um, any type of paddle. Unfortunately, I don't have um, paddles with me. I have my, my, my granddaddy helical, but it has to be a very directional antenna. The helical is the most directional on the market. Um, paddles are great too. Paddles, are, uh, uh, you know, log periodic dipole array. It's, it's, it's fairly wide, but once you get to the general area where you're seeing an increase in the signal on your analyzer, as you pass through a zone, if you want to tighten it up, spin the antenna around and use the back of the antenna as a notch because the notch is very much tighter than the front end of the antenna. Oh, so you could use, yeah, you could use the back of an antenna to notch out that signal once you're in the ballpark. Because, you know, RF is going to bounce off metallic objects. It might take a minute to narrow it down to a given area. And then once you do get to that area, spin it around, look for the notch. Sure. That's great. Um, so we do have some questions. Let's go ahead and work backwards. I think that'll be easiest. So uh, Gordon asks, uh, any minimum thickness or quality of metal for the trays? Or can I line a shoebox with cooking foil? Absolutely. Here's, here's my thing. First, if I don't have trays on site, first thing I do is I go to production and I say, go down to Walmart and pick up a bunch of pan, uh, meatloaf dishes. And yes, every single person that walks by your RF area is going to say, oh, we're having a cookie sale, bake sale later, right? Yeah, yeah, can have a bake sale later. The next thing you go, if you can't do that, go to lighting, try to get some black wrap. That works great. Um, if that fails, go to catering and get tin foil. I fixed more problems with regular off the shelf aluminum foil. You know, you can even put it on the control units of a, a, a you know, a gooseneck mic or an LED wall and it'll attenuate the interference wow. from the LED wall. All you, in fact, now when I start, show up to certain shows, the tech manager walks in with a, a bag full of aluminum foil from Kmart, you know, from That's great. Uh, whatever your store is. Sure. So yes, it doesn't have any metal will work. Any metal will work. That's great. Um, so we had a couple questions back when we were talking about um, spread spectrum systems, you know, especially in the 1.9. So this is a question from Jan. Um, is there any rules on how to coordinate, you know, Bolero and FreeSpeak at the same venue? I know for internally, like FreeSpeak has a um, a sync system. So if you were using two separate FreeSpeaks they wouldn't jump on top of each other when they're switching. But is there any, you know, common way for, you know, different systems to interact, to not step on each other? Right. So I'm not aware of any, and I could only tell you that all the shows that I've been on where people have tried to operate a Bolero and a FreeSpeak, they both crash in certain areas. They don't crash everywhere all the time, but when certain packs walk by, uh, let's say a Bolero pack walks close to a free speak base station, you'll take hits if, and vice versa. Sure. And when they come to me, the, the problem with that is that, you know, if, if you come to me as the RF coordinator, I can't help. There's nothing I can do to fix a situation when you're using non coordinatable equipment. And that's good if it's only a Bolero and a free speak. Once the other 1.9 stuff start, if you start reading up on what else they want to put up in 1.9 gig, we're about to get inundated in the production community with non-audio or com related 1.9 gig. Then what's going to happen? It that that any any RF equipment ha, has to the same RF rules that apply to analog and every other frequency apply to digital and spread spectrum. Sure. RF is RF. That's it. And I think how I've approached it in the past is it is part of the band plan. And so if you know you're going to have um, uh, Gary Rosen with uh, Pliant is also on here and, and mentioned, you know, Crewcom Intercom can also sync in with other Crewcom systems. You know, if your band plan is we're going to have a 1.9 Intercom system and that's all we're going to put up there and then we're going to be able to fit, you know, other pieces around that, you, you don't have to worry about it. But it's when you start having multiple technologies in that spread spectrum in the deck band, for instance, 
um, that there's no real way of, of coordinating that. Yeah, the largest um, event that, the, the largest events, I should say, plural, that, that I've been involved with, we had uh, 1.9 gig deck, either a Bolero or a FreeSpeak. We've had CrewCom, we've had RAD. So we've, we've spread out the comms and with the use of that many, Rose Bowl is a prime example. It's not the CrewCom, it's the coach, it's the coach com sure. that is made by, uh, by the same company, obviously. So, so that equipment is in, in the 902 to 928 but it's separated because the coaches use it. So it's, it's a yep. team use. And then we'll have the production might be using um, Riedel and then ESPN set will have rats. So here's a case where everybody's getting covered with their comms, but we literally have to use three manufacturers and three different frequency bands to, to make it happen. Sure. But I haven't got to the point yet where it's impossible. Sure. I can tell you that much. Um, so a question from Eadline is other than one nine two four and five eight gig frequencies to stay away from. Um, what frequencies in those areas can be coordinated? Is there anything in that one nine or higher, you know, that you could actually coordinate to specific frequencies? The only thing that comes close, and I believe it might even be um, pliant, and Gary could answer it, is yeah. that you can set. Uh, you can set within the 902 to 928 band. I'm not sure if they could do it with 2.4, but I think you can set three different bands. In other words, we go 902 to, you know, 910 and 910 to 915 and 950. Yep. You know what I mean? So, so I, I believe that, but I don't know of any other manufacturers that uh, give you any uh, additional co uh, coordinating ability with spread spectrum technology. That's great. And Gary actually just chimed in that um, they allow for a half split. Um, same with their two, four system. So oh, there you that go. does allow for some control when you're in those zones. Absolutely. Uh, that's great. Um, so we have a question from Bob. Uh, is there any guidance on how to deal with a video wall that emits a lot of R RF hash? Right. Yes, absolutely. So there are a couple things to know about the RF video wall interference. It's very near field. It's very near field. Uh, which means that if you back your antennas away from the video wall by about 20 feet uh, or more is better, of course, then you're going to lower that noise floor, hopefully to nothing. Remember, it's not the wall itself. It's the power supplies and control mechanisms. So beyond moving your antennas, you can put tin foil, aluminum foil, or black wrap uh, on those control mechanisms. And sure. those two things, and I've been working with video walls on every show for years now. And between those two um, fixes, we're uh, successful. And I think we touched on that a little bit in our antenna webinar as well. The yes. idea of understanding your operating area and understanding your scenic environment as well of what, you know, might be causing interference. Um, we do have a question from Chris. Any advice to maximize audio dynamic range, signal to noise, et cetera, for wireless measurement microphones. Yeah, because I believe those are analog. So proper setting of your audio gain will do exactly that. That was at a, a, a graphic with a, with a blonde reporter holding the mic upside down with the, it, it showed the signal to noise ratio. So basically the bottom line is every, every transmitter has an overload red light and the receiver has an over, overload red light. If you yell into it the loudest that it will be used, that red light should flicker, it should tap. That's the proper setting, not to make it sound too untechnical, but, sure. but that, that's the setting. You're getting the most, the best signal to noise ratio you can by just getting to the limiter on the input of the audio section of the transmitter. That's great. Um, going back to handheld scanners, uh, what was the exact model of the ICOM handheld? Um, this is from Roland. He says there are so many ICOMs available. There are, and I bought this one so long ago that I, I it's probably obsolete. Uh, this sure. one, uh, it's going to make me get my glasses, huh? Give me a second. But yeah, uh, no worries. I, I would say if you have a ham radio, if there's a ham radio store somewhere, go with that. This one is the IC R3. That's the model Great. on that one. Um, and, and again, it's great for analog. If you're looking for something sure. to watch digital, then obviously a newer model. 
And from Lucas, back to kind of scanners, analyzers, uh, do you have a system to check your cables? And this goes back to a question that we had beforehand as well as uh, what's your preferred uh, cable for RF systems? Right, so RG8 is my preferred cable. In fact, that's the only cable I use unless I'm jumping no more than six feet from a rack to a rack. Sure. But any antennas, anything connected to antenna will have RG8. And my trick is I don't label any cables until I shoot them with the, with the Roden Schwartz or if you have an RF Explorer. And once I generate a signal, it a, could be a 100-foot cable, a 200-foot cable. Once I generate the signal um, in one port and read it as clean on the receive port, I put white tape, white gaff tape. And now I know I've checked it. And I can now write in-ear monitor TX or, you know, wireless mic, A channel, whatever the cable is going to be used for. But if it's not labeled, it hasn't been tested. Sure. And so I, I found a, bad cables. There are, there are bad cables. Sure. Do make that. I have a question about the war game, um, which I think is a, is a great um, scenario for, you know, finding out what your noise floor is on, on each channel. Um, how do you start with power settings? You right. know, do we start at the lowest setting and then bump up as necessary? Or what's your, what's your take on setting power for all the different transmitters? Okay, so obviously that, again, is gonna depend on your specific scenario. If you're in a church and your receivers or your antennas are 20 feet away from the pastor and the pastor is not gonna walk out into the you know, crowd and all that, then you could start off with a low setting. Uh, analog systems, 10 to 20 milliwatts should do it. Although I've known pastors that somehow absorb RF, sure. they absorb specific frequencies. I'm not going to get into why that might be, but I know it's happened. Um, if you're looking for some longer range, 50 milliwatts for analog is typically um, more than enough, right? Because whatever your transmit setting is, you can make up for that on the receive side with a gain antenna. I mean, think about this, this helical antenna I have here, that's going to give you 12 dB of passive gain. So that means that I could take a, a you know, a, a two milliwatt signal and get the same range as I would out of a 50 milliwatt signal using a lesser antenna. Okay. Sure. Um, I never start with all of my um, power levels cranked up all the way. More is not better. Matter of fact, as I mentioned, when I was talking about that radioactive um, TX8 combiner, you can create noise and interference onto your own systems that you wouldn't have had if you didn't have those cranked up to a quarter watt. Sure. I, I generally like to keep it at 100 milliwatts, but um, again, I work with uh, a lot of monitor techs, deck techs, and they're the ones who have to take the hard time from the artist if there's a, if there's a problem. So I get it. And um, in that case, I will spider out antennas under the stage, and we covered this in our previous um, webinar, and if you, as soon as you split an antenna more than one time, you've just turned that quarter watt of power into 75 milliwatts. So if I'm splitting an antenna system output, then I'll start with higher power. But generally, it's somewhere in the middle. And with digital, 20 milliwatts is plenty for a microphone. And it goes back to understanding the operational range. Again, if you have the artist that you know is going to be out way in the house at some point, you know, having their... IM system cranked a little bit higher than the stationary band members makes sense. Yep. Yep. For the bands, usually they'll just have a receiver rack right on the band riser because that's going to feed pedals and all kinds of stuff. What's the range there? It's going to be like, you know, five, six feet. So sure. they go to 10 milliwatts, 10 milliwatts right. and they're pegged. Yep. Uh, great. So we have a question from Roger here. Um, any insight on software tools for successful coordination aside from wireless workbench and IAS? I think this is something we'll likely cover in our next webinar as well for Intermod software. Um, but just quickly, any other tools that you sure. use commonly? I, I, not that I use, but I know there's a, a guy, a good, really good, smart young man, Don Kuzer. He works for Professional Wireless Systems up in New York, and um, he's working on some, some killer killer coordination software. I'm not sure if they're going to distribute it through PWS or not, but I will find out before the next uh, webinar. Just he, he was blowing me away because whenever we get on a show together, he, he shows me his progress and he's really a bright, 
bright young man. And this looks sure. like it's going to be some crazy software when it comes out. Great. We've got a, a good, well, question and uh, comment from James here. Um, I did a show at the TCU Amphitheater in Indianapolis. My IEM system is 516 to 558, and there were no usable frequencies in this bandwidth on that day and time. Any advice on why and what should have been my solution process? I yeah. guess this goes back to uh, band planning, and especially with the TV repack, understanding the density of TV stations in each city that you might be operating in and where usable frequencies might be found these days. Right. So, so we're going to see this more and more specifically if you're a traveling um, operator where you'll see back to back um, DTV stations that cover the entire spectrum of your device. In that case, it, it was 518 to 554. It sounded like a Sennheiser uh, uh, a split uh, Sennheiser sure. in ears, what it sounded like. But I will tell you this, there are things you could do to get at least six or eight of those to work. Even if you have back to back DTV signals, you can go in between the two DTV channels. There's a, a little teeny slot of a couple of hundred kilohertz. So in other words, directly on 518, the next one would be directly on 524. The next one would be directly on 530, 536, 542. Every six meg between those channels, you, you can make it work. You'll have to put your transmit antenna as close to the artist as you can get it. But I can tell you, I've done it at the Rose Bowl under Mount Wilson in an open venue with a 50 milliwatt transmitter. And I was able to cover the whole field by using the space between DTV channels. It's the only way you're going to get away with it if you're back to back DTV. Sure. And I know for some coordination softwares, again, we'll dig deeper into this in the next webinar. But for instance, Workbench um, doesn't Nat uh, natively allow you to sneak in those channels between the DTV stations. Um, but it is something that you can do uh, if, if you know what you're doing. Yeah. And remember, and we'll talk about this more with the coordination uh, August webinar, but these coordination software, they're, they're just tools. They, they're, they're math coprocessors. I mean, it's doing millions of calculations in a microsecond, but that doesn't mean it's right. Like I said earlier, I can get IS, which is, you know, my favorite software because I help write it. You know, when I we were still PWS is in my house when Jason and I sat down and scratched that whole thing out. So I love it. And I, I get it. But you could get numbers out of the software that won't work in the real world. You could only use that as a crutch and interpret the data. That's the best. That's what you could do. You still need to use your kidneys up here to make the final decision. You know, sure. Um, question from Paul Keller. Uh, how do the WMAS systems like Sennheiser is proposing work? I'm not familiar with those systems. Me neither. I'm okay. not oh, wait, with W, I, I don't know. I wouldn't presume. Yeah, to, WMAS. To Paul, I'll look into that and uh, we'll, we'll send you an answer after the webinar here. Um, another question from Bob. Uh, is RG6 cable okay to use? I don't come across it that much. Uh, I, I, you know, RG8 is, is so, it's so available in our, sure. in our production community that I don't, I've never used RG6 myself. If it's sure. a 50 ohm, if it's a 50 ohm cable and it has decent loss, you know, below say three DB per hundred feet, then by all means use it. But I would think if it were 50 ohms and had low loss, I, I would have seen it out on a truck somewhere. Sure. Um, so I do have a couple more questions here. Um, and, uh, from Marty just uh, wrote in that RG six is a 75 ohm cable. There you go. So, so yeah. wouldn't be, wouldn't be the greatest. It won't kill you, but it wouldn't be the, you know, my first choice. Sure. Um, so a question or something from Marty here, uh, we have, <clears throat> troubleshot a lot of large venue wireless systems where the digital TV signal fools the pilot tone on low end FM UHF receivers. A digital so, TV station fools the pilot tone on a low end FM UHF receiver. Hmm. So I'm not sure if that is um, in scanning for a system that it thinks that it's, it's trying to find an existing handheld right. transmitter, for instance. 
Yeah, I'm not sure how to answer that. I mean, yeah. I would just I would avoid the DTV station altogether. But the only way you're going to get you're, the only way you're going to cause a pilot tone dropout. Well, then I guess you could always go in and disable the pilot tone on the receiver. Then sure. it's wide open. The bad news is if you get a dropout, it's going to be really noisy. But but the, you can tell a receiver, oh, don't use my pilot tone. Just disable yeah. it. You could do it really easily, actually. And this goes back to our question about the IAM systems in um, Indianapolis um, that, you know, for a lot of, in, in some of the software, especially, um, if it sees a DTV station, for instance, in its scan, and you see the leading edge and then it comes down and then it kind of tapers off. And for whatever reason, the software says, oh, we could maybe fit a wireless mic somewhere in here. Right. Um, what are your thoughts on how to, at what threshold should you just be completely avoiding that DTV station? Okay, that's a great question. So um, when you see a DTV station that does not look like a square wave, when you see part of it is lower, the only reason for that is because of the, the uh, position of your sweep antenna. If I take a, an, an, that same antenna and move it three feet over, uh, the, the entire picture will change. You might have a full-fledged square the reason why you see some tapering off has more to do with reflective surfaces in the room and how that signal is making it or multipath canceling more likely over your sweep antenna. But believe me, if any part of that DTV station, I, I would go by the strongest part of it. The sure. strongest part of that DTV station is what you should consider is the worst case. Okay. I, I see it all the time. And believe me, I say the same thing and I pray, Oh God, please let me be able to do this. But I know that, yep. you know, somewhere along the line, there's an artist is going to walk on a stage and the, the, the signal is going to be completely pegged right there. So, sure. and, and as far as where, um, where uh, I would, it's, I would use any DTV station if the um, peak carrier, not the pile tone, but if the peak Part of the digital signal is at least 84 dBm negative. Great. Okay, sure. Uh, and and that's actually legal. You're legally allowed to operate wireless mics as long as the DTV carrier is minus 84 dBm in a venue. And everything over that, it's just worth excluding that entire six meg block and and avoiding it entirely. Yeah. If now you know he, the bottom line is this. Okay. Eventually, you have to deep you have to dig deeper into the barrel, right? You have to go down further in a barrel. The idea is start with the cleanest stuff. And then as you run into problems, say, okay, let me dig down a little deeper into the barrel. And I ah, this isn't my first choice, but the producer is still screaming for another 12 RFs because his favorite band just brought their own RFs. So, you know, at some point you, you have to, you have to dig deeper into the barrel and maybe one of those DTV stations might be a place to do it. But if, if, if I did, I didn't bring it. If I, if I were to do that, I would pop attenuators. You can buy from mini circuits, um, attenuators are $38 each and you could attenuate that DTV to where um, the receiver won't see it at all. But the signal from the transmitter is strong enough to give you a good signal to noise ratio. So it's counterintuitive because by adding attenuation, you're improving your, your, your sure. range. Totally counterintuitive. That makes but, sense though. Yeah. A um, couple more questions here. One from John uh, thoughts on transmit filtering for output of IEM combiners. Absolutely. If you, um, you know, if you have eight, um, uh, uh, so let's say not to pick on Shure or anything, but just say Shure PSMs or did uh, Sennheiser 2000s, whatever you want. Will. Okay, going into a rad combiner set at a quarter watt, that's two watts of radiated power. So yeah, you're going to see your eight primary signals, and then you're going to see this this comb, you know, like, sure. like a comb lines going out. You can't get rid of those comb lines inside the box, but you can filter them out. And where do you put the filter? Between the active device and the antenna. So the filter would go at the antenna output of the combiner into the antenna and you will suppress all of that uh, splatter. That's splatter. You sure. suppress it all. That's great. Um, just a couple more questions here. Uh, let's see, we've got uh, from Patricio. How often should I calibrate an RF scanner and where, because I'm from Chile. 
Um, so is uh, RF scanning calibration, is, is that something you should have to do often? Hey, Patricio, I miss you. Can't wait to see you. I want to come down to Chile and visit with Patricio. Love Patricio. So this thing, they want $2,400 to calibrate it. I haven't had it calibrated in years. You know what I will do, though? I will check it against a wireless mic. And okay. if it's within a tolerance that I am happy with and I can live with, I'm not going to spend $2,500. I'll buy a new scanner before I'll spend $2,500 to get to get this back, you know, calibrated. If it checks out with a wireless that I know came from the factory, then the wireless says, um, you know, 495 meg, and I turn on my spectrum analyzer and it's 495 meg, you know, dot zero zero three. Guess what? For 2,500 bucks, I can live with that. You know, sure. if it's so far off that it's ruining my sweeps, then yeah, I'm going to have to belly up to the bar and either buy a new one or send that one in. But um, I would, I would say as long as your equipment checks out to your, um, your, an acceptable amount for you, save the money unless somebody else is paying. If you're working sure. for a broadcaster, absolutely have it sent in as often as you want. But if you're paying as an individual, I mean, you know, if it works for you and it's worked up to this point and you're okay with whatever um, it might be off of intolerance, save the money. Sure. And we've got a question from Lisa here um, back to uh, cabling types. Uh, what about RG8X? Yeah, RG yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, I was going to say for us, I know at TC Furlong, we use that for the smaller jumps, interact things like that. What are, what are your thoughts on 8X? So 8X is great cable. It's actually not very lossy at all. I would, I would use a hundred foot run of it. It's, um, it's really easy to handle. It's a lot lighter than lugging around uh, RG8, which is very heavy. There's, there's nothing wrong with RG8X at all. It's a really good cable. It, it, I, I just don't see it a lot. Again, if, if the companies that supply RF to me on my shows um, sent RG8X, I'd, I'd be fine with it. Great. So we've got one more question going back to uh, the video wall. Um, done. This is from Eadline. I've done projects with as many as 1500 plus video panels and floor video tiles, each having their own power supply and controller boxes. Should I be looking to foil or black wrap just the panels close to the show to minimize uh, found interference? Um, is this something that you could use the scanner for to kind of to try to find what might be the closest or culprit to your antennas, for instance? That's exactly how I determined that it wasn't the LED wall, but it was specific power supplies and control units by using a scanner and a directional antenna. And you get it right down to the, and they're not all culprits, right? Sure. Not every power supply spl splatters all over the place. And not every control box, you know, is emitting this random RF. Yes, absolutely use a scanner. You don't have to go around and, and black wrap it. First off, as audio people, we don't have the time to do that. You know, sure. we, 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 an awful lot is usually expected of us in a small amount of time. I'm amazed we get our job done as it is. So yeah, I would say um, use a scanner if it's a big problem. And the biggest thing, get your mic receivers away from that video wall. It's a near field um, interference. It doesn't go very far. Sure. Uh, so we got a Two more questions left, and I know we, we need to uh, wrap up here in just a few minutes. This one's from Justin. Uh, do you see any need to use anything less lossy than RG8, such as LMR 400? You know, if you're doing an installation and you have a ton of money and you need to run a 600 foot um, RF cable, then yeah, LMR 400. But now since, since the, um, I'd say acceptance of RF over fiber, if sure. you get into runs that long, I, you, you should be looking at an RF over fiber system at that point, unless you're talking base station transmitters like in-ear monitors or comms, because you cannot put high power onto fiber. If you're talking about wireless mic receives or comm belt packs, then I would go fiber. If you are talking um, a high power IFB in-ear or comm transmitter, then I'd go with the LMR 400. Sure. And Bob also mentioned um, RG213, 9913, along with LMR400. They have loss, less loss at upper UHF area. 
So I think it's also understanding what you're using, what band you'll be using the cable for, and right. especially for long runs and especially installations, understanding uh, turn radius on some of those cables and how they'll be installed. Yeah. Things like that are also a factor. Right. Price, weight. Absolutely. Sure. Okay. So we've got one last question from Jan here. Uh, is there any significant difference between having high power, so 200 milliwatt, two watt IEM transmit and a passive RF combiner like the WYSI CSI 16T and normal power 30 milliwatt active combiner? Okay. So basically if you are using, well, I don't know of any in-ears that go up to 200 milliwatts. A hundred is the, the most I know of. Sure. And if you combine that four times, each signal ends up being 25 milliwatts or less. You're cutting the power by, you know, into a quarter. Okay. You have to know that going in. Um, I would, I would rather go with an active combiner, even if it's just unity gain, because 25 milliwatts is generally not enough for an in-ear system. You could also use your in-ear transmit antenna to give you additional gain. Like I said, the helical is 12 dBd which means if you put in 25 milliwatts, theoretically, if you use a helical, that gets kicked up to 250 milliwatts. Passively. Sure. So it's just a couple of couple of things to consider. But I, you said no more questions, but let me just, there was, somebody asked about the- um, Ah, yes. The setup of, of antennas on multiple polar patterns. And so the trick is, it doesn't matter if you're setting it up um, as as a uh, one vertical and one horizontal or if you want to do the you know the v setup as long as the angle between the two antennas is 90 degrees you've covered two opposite polarizations that's the short answer doesn't matter what anything else about how that antenna those two antennas are placed as long as one is 90 degrees out of polarization than the other that's the trick that's the answer right there that's great. And so this question came in the, um, in the registration of right. um, whether or not your, and this is typically for whip antennas, but also could be for directional paddle antennas as well. Absolutely. Any, yeah. any, uh, any uh, non multipolarized antenna. Yeah. Whether or not 45 degrees was best or one horizontal, one vertical and, and what the difference would be there. Right. The, the as, only the only thing I could say may be a consideration is if you're putting them on a stage and there's metal on the stage. Obviously, you don't want to be perpendicular to metal. So okay. Then you want to raise them up. But if sure. there's no metal close by, it's just ninety a ninety degree angle is what's going is what's going to make that multipolarized. That's great. All right, I think that is all of our questions here. Um, James, thank you for your time. Thank you for the second webinar here. Again, if anyone had missed the antenna webinar that is available on our uh, YouTube page and we've recorded today's webinar. So we'll hopefully have that up within the next week and we'll make sure to let everyone know when that's available, if you would like to rewatch. Um, and James has offered the PowerPoint to anyone that would want a copy of that as well, you can email our team at sales at TC Furlong to get a copy of that. James, we, we really appreciate your time here and, and hey, expertise. Thanks for having me. And I can't wait to see everybody again in person. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, thanks again uh, to Matt Calera, who's on the TC Furlong team for helping us out behind the scenes here as well. Um, there is an exit survey that we will ask everyone to fill out. Uh, also has a couple uh, a spot there for future webinars if you have any suggestions for our team. Um, and uh, James, once we get our August or later summer uh, webinar date arranged, we'll make sure to send an email out to everyone that registered here uh, to sign up for that as well. Awesome. Thanks. All right. Thanks a lot, James. See you.